rest, everybody. For those of you who, uh, who don't know me, uh, I'm Michael Freider. I'm the Rector of UNSW Canberra at the Australian Defence Force Academy. And I'd like to welcome you all here this evening for the 2013 University Lecture. I'd particularly uh, like to welcome uh, Kate Carnell, who's uh, going to be giving the lecture and who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, General David Hurley, Chief of the Defence Force, uh, and Mrs Hurley. Senator David Johnson, the uh, Coalition Spokesperson on Defence. Commodore Bruce Kafer, Air Commodore Steve Robertin, representing the Chief of the Air Force. Senior Officers of the Defence Force, Senior Members of UNSW Canberra, Distinguished Guests, uh, Ladies and Gentlemen. These lectures now have been running for 12 years and their aim is to inform officer cadets and midshipmen about issues and concepts that are not a formal part of their academic curricula. And they therefore play an integral role in providing a broader understanding of the world and the important issues of the day. We invite speakers that will motivate, inspire and hopefully even challenge the way you think about the broader social and political environment and your role in it. As future leaders of the Australian Defence Force, exposure to these ideas will expand the breadth of your intellectual viewpoint and assist you in developing as a leader and as a person. With this in mind, it's my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished speaker this evening, Ms Kate Carnell. Kate Carnell was appointed Chief Executive Officer at Beyond Blue in 2012 and has been a director of Beyond Blue since 2008. Beyond Blue is a national, independent, not-for-profit organisation working to address issues associated with depression and anxiety. Previously, Ms Carnell was CEO of the Australian Food and Grocery Council and the Australian General Practice Network and is a pharmacist by profession. As I'm sure everybody is aware, uh, she also served as Chief Minister of the ACT, being elected originally in 1995 and then re-elected in 1998. And for the sports fans among you, I think it's fair to say that we should think of her as the mother of Bruce Stadium as we now know it. Ms Carnell was appointed as an officer in the Order of Australia in 2006 for her services to the community through contributions to economic development and the medical sector. This evening, she will present a lecture entitled The Three E's of Leadership, Enthusiasm, Empathy and Ethics, and will share with us the major leadership lessons that she has learned over the years and the importance of people skills and the ability to motivate people to their full potential. Would you please join with me in welcoming Kate Carnell. Thank you all very much. It's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here tonight. You know, I love the quote I once heard in a particularly inspiring speech I heard uh, from General Col Colin Powell. He said that leadership is the art of uh, achieving more than the science of management says is possible. Sort of an interesting quote, isn't it? Because I think it really um, focuses on that difference between what good management is and what real leadership is. It's certainly true that good managers are people who run great systems, who are reliable, who are predictable, who set great goals, who uh, achieve wonderful things in organisations, who make systems work. You could say people who really make the world go round. But it's leaders who take us to a new place, who allow us to, to grow, to innovate, to do things that are just a bit out of the ordinary. And tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about, from my perspective um, and what I've learned um, in uh, my various leadership roles uh, over the years. And interestingly, most of those lessons uh, weren't while well, I was Chief Minister, when I was probably in the most, uh, I suppose, high profile leadership position I've had. They've been in a various, various other spaces. Because I think we now accept that, or well, maybe there's a growing realisation that it takes more than intellectual ability, technical skills, even academic qualifications or years of experience to be a successful leader. It takes people skills, 
the ability to listen, to persuade, to inspire, to get that little bit extra out of the people who are working for you uh, or with you. I think once upon a time those would have probably been called the soft issues, but they really are the key to effective leadership, whether it be in business, politics, or the sort of roles that I, role that I've got now in a, in a charity, in a not-for-profit. And those sort of soft issues were certainly the key to, uh, to success uh, back running my own little businesses, uh, my own pharmacies. I bought my first pharmacy when I was 25 uh, at Red Hill, not so far from, from here in Canberra. I was young, I was inexperienced, I was keen, I had all sorts of great plans and visions. I had this great strategic plan with lots of arrows and graphs and all sorts of things. I was really, really disappointed that my staff weren't impressed at all when I started and showed them the strategic plan we had for the direction that the pharmacy was going to take. So I learned pretty quickly that uh, strategic plans, although really important, aren't necessarily the way you can inspire and encourage people to share uh, your vision. I learned pretty quickly that it was optimism, uh, enthusiasm, and a capacity to put things simply. That strategic plan, and I, I found a copy of it when I was moving a couple of years ago, it was quite big and it was a result of uh, some small business management courses I'd done. I was very proud of it, I do remember, but it wasn't exactly short or simple, I'd have to say. I learned quickly in my pharmacy that my mood affected my staff's mood. Um, even my customers' mood as well. So if I came in, you know, very down in the mouth, if I came in um, after a, um, a big night out, and there might have been one of those back when I was uh, 25, um, it wasn't terribly long until the staff were in exactly the same place, you know, with the same, uh, um, I suppose, uh, lack of enthusiasm, uh, with the, the same pessimism. So I think one of the really important things that I learned then was my mood, my approach, affected uh, my staff and their approach, and even, you know, the customers who came, who came in the door. If we were a happy place, a happy pharmacy, interestingly, so were the customers as well. Now that might seem sort of self, you know, sort of, you know, yeah, what else did you expect? I didn't expect it to be quite as dramatic as it was. And it shows you why, you know, bosses uh, uh, who whinge, who blame, who uh, are pessimistic, can end up with, with engendering exactly the same um, approaches in the people who work with them, their staff, the people that you are trying to lead. So it shows that, I suppose, my first rule um, of uh, leadership um, is that of enthusiasm. This it is so important. There is no doubt that um, enthusiasm and optimism is a force multiplier when it comes to, le to leadership. And I found that by taking that approach and taking my wonderful strategic plan and making it much simpler uh, and, and getting the staff to share that vision of where we wanted to take the pharmacy, making them feel part of that vision was a way to really make, well, to encourage them to go that step further. So what were we trying to do? We were going to be the best pharmacy in Canberra. We were going to focus on prevention and early intervention, all sorts of really exciting things. They might have seemed way out there. How could we do that at little old Red Hill? Um, but it was a vision, we did share it, and I'd have to say, we tripled the turnover of that pharmacy. We did a whole lot of really exciting things together. And I really remember um, that, um, I suppose, experience as being fundamental to the approach that I took uh, when I ended up um, in politics. Uh, those of you, um, in fact, all of you um, live, live in Canberra, you'd know that Canberra isn't exactly a traditional liberal town, to put it mildly. Uh, so when um, 
I stood as uh, Chief Minister in 1995, nobody particularly expected us to win. But we did have a really solid view of what we wanted to do um, in Canberra, where we wanted to take Canberra, that we wanted Canberra to be um, a great place to do business, a place that young people can get jobs, not necessarily in the public service. We had some very simple, uh, not simple to do, but simple, a simple vision for what we wanted to do with Canberra. And we spoke about it a lot. I think we've just seen an election where Tony Abbott um, said the things he wanted to do time and time again till we were all bored of them. But the reality is that we knew what he stood for. And that really is important if you want to be a, a good leader. People need to know what you stand for. Uh, you know, I was a really unlikely politician, very unlikely because I wasn't a member of a party. That's usually a little bit of a problem um, when you stand for politics. Um, what I was, though, is I was involved in a whole range of things uh, around Canberra. I was president of the Pharmacy Guild, um, the ACT branch of the Pharmacy Guild. I was involved in the Chamber of Commerce, um, the Australian Institute of Pharmacy Management, a whole range of different community-based uh, and, and, I suppose, professional organisations. Um, and why was I? You know, I think it was my father. Dad ran a small business, small um, building business in Brisbane, and he was always involved in the Lions Club, in the Housing Industry Association, always involved in the, in the community and, the, and, and in his chosen profession. And he always instilled in me that you really couldn't ever whinge or you couldn't ever say they should do things if you weren't willing to put up your hand uh, and be uh, involved. So what, how I ended up in politics is a group of Canberra businessmen took me out to lunch one day and said, look, Kate, we'd like you to stand for the ACT Assembly. And I said, lovely, but I'm not a party member. They were from the Liberal Party. And they said, no, we can, we can solve that. That's, uh, that's not a problem. I said, well, the other minor problem is I'd actually never contemplated uh, going into, into politics. Um, we finished that lunch, and I'd sort of said, oh, look, I'll think about it, but oh, I don't think so. Um, they came back to me a couple of weeks later and said, look, um, we were at a, uh, a rally that you uh, ran um, a couple of, well, last week, they said. Um, it was um, a rally of small business operators who were being thrown out of some of the major um, town centres around Canberra. And you said that, uh, to, you said to them, if they weren't willing to put up, they should stop complaining. That they had to become involved in the campaign if they wanted, wanted to change things. We're saying to you today, Kate, if you really want to change those things that you're working on in Canberra through the Chamber and whatever, uh, you have to put up or shut up. What do you say to that? Well, I have to say what I said is, well, okay then. So I joined uh, the Liberal Party. To tell you a story about my father though, because remember I wasn't a member of the party, of a party, and we'd had lots of political debates as a kid. I rang my father and said, Dad, um, going to stand for politics, deathly silence. He said, for what party? Um, when I told him it was the Liberal Party, you could hear the sigh of relief. He was very worried that, um, anyway, by the by, that was, uh, that was Dad. So the, the, second, uh, the second rule, I suppose, is the importance of being engaged, engaged with your chosen uh, profession, your chosen uh, approach. Um, and also engaged with your community. Um, it just makes a fundamental difference uh, in leadership generally. So it's not, but it's not just enthusiasm or engagement that um, gives you the edge, that allows you to motivate people to do that little bit extra. The next, um, I suppose, thing that I think is important is the importance of making people feel important. The people who are around you, if you can make people feel important, it's amazing what they'll do, because everyone wants to feel important, don't they? Everyone wants to feel that they're special. I was lucky to be enough to be at a conference that, um, that I ran on behalf of the Pharmacy Guild in Hawaii, 
was the first and only conference I ever ran because um, I realised there was a reason you had conference organisers is because running conferences is really hard. Um, we had a cyclone, or I think it was a typhoon, the staff went on strike. Everything went wrong at this conference, but we had this great speaker um, who couldn't go anywhere because you couldn't get off the island of Maui, so he had to give lots of speeches. And he spoke about how if you can make the people, you know, your customers, your staff, um, if you can imagine that they've got MMFI, make me feel important on their, their forehead, it's amazing how that changes your attitude to them and the way that you can really, uh, I suppose, encourage them and, and enthuse, in, well, enthuse them, I suppose. That certainly was something that I learned pretty quickly in, in, in pharmacy. With my customers, if I could say, hi, Mrs. Jones, um, how'd your son go in that exam he did last week? Um, better than any marketing I could ever do, better than any specials you could ever have out the front. People want to feel important. And um, I took this to, through to politics, and in the first year as opposition leader, I went to over 350 um, multicultural and community events. Um, I did that because I was learning and I learned lots about different groups in Canberra, about people, so it was a real win for me. But it made all of those groups feel important enough that we'd bothered. We'd bothered going to their national day, we'd bothered going to their event. Um, and it's fascinating. Um, when I hear uh, people speak about door knocking, we've just had an election, so lots of people out door knocking. It's fascinating how often people say to me, look, we voted for you because you came and knocked on the door. Now you'd think that that would you know, make people say, go away, I don't want politicians at my door. But the usual response is, you cared enough to come and talk to me. It made them feel important. And this is really empathy. You know, to empathise with your staff, the people who are working with you, to put yourself in their shoes, to make them feel important, is really the way to get that little extra bit. The next issue is ethics. In pharmacy, you know, just following the law is not enough. You could sell six bottles of cough mixture and a dozen packets of painkillers quite legally to people, but, it, but it's not ethical. It's not reasonable, it's not professional to do so. So the reason that pharmacies, in my view, haven't been sucked up by supermarkets uh, in Australia is really because in pharmacy it's absolutely essential um, to operate ethically as well as legally. It's just as important to sell nothing to a, to a customer who doesn't need a product as it is um, to well, it's much more important to sell nothing than to sell the wrong thing. So learn pretty quickly that, you know, unless you operate it that way, if, if the sale was the, you know, the win, the goal, you'll get it pretty quickly fall over. It was the, the, it's that trust issue, the trust issue that runs around an ethical approach. In politics, that became even more evident. If people don't know what you stand for, so if you don't have a solid set of values that underpin who you are, then how can other people know what you stand for, who you are, or where your parameters uh, might, might sit? And I really, again, um, learnt that in a very stark way um, in the political space. I've always been involved in drug law reform. Back in my pharmacy, I ran a methadone clinic and needle exchange. It's something I care deeply about. In politics, um, we uh, put forward a proposal to trial medical heroin for, um, uh, for people who the methadone program had not worked for and for people who were, who were at risk uh, of dying as a result of heroin addiction. Um, that is done in many parts of the world, but you, this is an out there policy. It's an out there policy, particularly for a Liberal government. Initially, about 20% of the community thought it was a good idea, but that changed to about 60% over time, and the, re the response I got often from people is, well, look, Kate, we're not sure about this medical heroin thing, but at least we know what you stand for. We know you're doing it because you believe it. We know you've got, you know, you've done the research, you've done the hard yards. So even when you, when people don't quite, um, 
I suppose, share your values or your ethical base, uh, if they know that's what you stand for, it's amazing how far that goes. And you know, in the political space, if you think about John Howard, um, many people now talk about John Howard as one of the great prime ministers that Australia's had. And the reason often is we knew exactly what he stood for. We knew that if he said it, it's probably what he'd do. Uh, and probably where some other politicians of more recent days have had some problems is that dilemma of people not knowing exactly what to expect. So from a leadership perspective, uh, this becomes, uh, oh, well, I think, really important. The other thing I learned in pharmacy was the importance of entrepreneurial spirit. And you might think this is a really strange thing to talk about, but you know, you're never gonna have all the information that exists to make a decision. On a number of occasions back in pharmacy, I was looking at expanding into, um, into new pharmacies and I, and I did that. But in one particular case, um, there was a really great opportunity coming up I'd, you know, I was doing research, putting together the business plan, all those sorts of things. But you know what happened? I just kept on thinking there's just a bit more information. I know it's a really good idea, but there's a bit more information. We just wanted to do a bit more work. And guess what? Somebody else picked up that pharmacy and it turned out to be one of the best uh, uh, in, in Canberra. So it's an absolute truth that in leadership, you have to be willing to take a punt sometimes. You can get around about 80%, I reckon, of the information, but when your gut tells you, okay, this is the right thing to do, you have to be able to trust your gut. And probably that's the difference between a good manager and a leader. A manager, a manager will look at following systems, making sure it's right, avoiding risk, and a leader will know when to take the punt, when to take that, uh, that next, um, I suppose, scenario. So, or oh, that next plunge, maybe. So the things I've gone through, from my perspective about leadership, um, are what you might call the, uh, the five E's of management, and that's enthusiasm, engagement, empathy, make me feel important, ethics, and entrepreneurial spirit. But there's also one other E that I really learned in politics, and that's enemies. Um, and not enemies in politics so much, but the fact that you've got to understand in leadership you can't make everyone happy. Making you know, tough decisions means some people aren't gonna like you. So you can't, you, know, you can't be friends with everybody. There are going to be people who are going to find the things that you've done you know, difficult. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I suppose um, it means that really the story is being responsible, taking control, sometimes means pissing, pissing people off, really. And you have to take that on board. It's part, of the, it's part of leadership. I wanted to spend the last five or ten minutes talking about uh, what I've done since politics. One of the things I learnt after politics, after a particular, the first job I took was a great job, really loved it, but I wasn't passionate about it. Just, you know, great job, but just wasn't me. I learned after that that, you know, it's really important not to, it's really important to be passionate about what you're doing every day. You do, you, you, you're at work too often to do something that's not fun, that's not something that you really believe um, well, that motivates you. So since then, and you heard a bit of um, the sorts of things I've been doing um, since, uh, since politics, but now I'm in my absolute passion job. Uh, that's as CEO of Beyond Blue. The reason it's my passion job um, is because almost every single one of us is affected in some way by uh, mental health issues. The statistics are quite dramatic. Today in Australia, a million people will be living with depression, about 2.4 million people uh, with an anxiety disorder. One in five of us will experience depression or anxiety or mental health issues at some stage during our life. So it means every single family, every single workplace, every single um, pharmacy, leadership group, um, whatever, will have people who are struggling um, in them. 
Yesterday was National Suicide or International Suicide Prevention Day. You know, in Australia, 44 people die every week as a result of suicide. 33 of those are men, and the majority of them are in the peak of their working years, and that's in the 25 to 50 space, although um, a good percentage still um, as younger people as well. That's double the number of people who die on our roads. 80% of those people who die as a result of suicide were experiencing depression, usually untreated depression, at the time um, of, their, of their deaths. So that's at one end of the scale, and you know, that's a tragedy. You know, every death uh, is a tragedy, but death by suicide uh, affects family, it affects workplaces, it affects, it affects all of us. Um, it's something that, well, for me, matters a lot. So why do so many people not get the help they need? With men, that's around about 60%, even higher in some particular groups of men who don't get help or don't get support, or experiencing symptoms of depression or anxiety but don't get the support they need. Women are a bit better, although we're not, we're not wonderful, but uh, it's around about 50% of women do get the help they need, 50% don't. So men are less likely to put up their hand and say, hey, I'm struggling a bit. And why is that the case? Well, there's still an awful lot of stigma around depression and anxiety, isn't there? There shouldn't be, because depression and anxiety are just illnesses like diabetes or cardiovascular disease or, or arthritis. Uh, they need to be treated the same way. If you had diabetes, you wouldn't say, I'm tough, I'll just pull up my socks and soldier on, would you, really? You'd go and get treatment. You'd go on a proper diet. You'd, get, you know, you'd do all the things you needed to do to manage your diabetes. Similarly with cardiovascular disease, similarly, similarly with asthma or other chronic conditions. We still, unfortunately, have a view, at least in some circumstances, where mental health issues are somehow different. They're not. Um, if you're experiencing the symptoms of depression or anxiety, the important thing to do is to get some support. Uh, treatment's available, and by the way, it works. It works lots better if you get treatment early. If you wait till crisis time, um, it just takes that much more time, more, more difficulty in, going, in getting to that recovery um, space. So what is depression? Well, depression isn't about just feeling a bit sad. We all feel sad sometimes. It's not about being a bit down when things don't go right in your life. That isn't what depression is. Uh, depression is a very real illness. It doesn't only affect your mental health, but it also affects physical health uh, as well. The sort of symptoms um, are certainly feeling sad and a bit out of it, but for a, pr a prolonged period of time, for more than two weeks, possibly more than, more than a month, it also, um, the symptoms are things like lack of energy, not being able to concentrate, having sleep disorder, dis, um, disorder. so it's waking up at three o'clock in the morning every, you know, all the time, those sorts of things, feeling sick, feeling run down. And because of the stigma again, people don't say, hey, I'm just not feeling great, you know, and go and see a doctor or go and get uh, support. Anxiety symptoms, not just about being a bit stressed, we all get stressed, you can end up doing uh, speeches like this and end up being a bit stressed. That's sort of normal, really. Uh, anxiety uh, symptoms, uh, things like feeling anxious and stressed all the time and it affecting the way you run your life. So it impacting upon your normal life. For some people, it means that they find it difficult to um, go to particular you know, venues, shopping centres, other things, so they can have phobias or, um, or stress-induced panic attacks, 
when they uh, go to particular sorts of uh, sorts of areas. Uh, there's there's obviously panic attacks, post traumatic stress disorder that I'm sure um, many of you have heard about, and hopefully you have. Um, because post-traumatic stress disorder is a very real issue for people who have a traumatic incident or set of incidents in their lives, particularly if they're in a position where their life might be, uh, uh, might be at risk. Um, so the symptoms you could look at, you could look for um, in anxiety are things like very physical symptoms, such as dizziness, fainting, feeling numb, tingling, hot and cold flushes. Now I get those, but it's not for that reason. Um, uh, sorry, for well, you're all too young to know. Um, racing heart, um, a whole range of those sorts of uh, of those sorts of issues. Um, and you know, in the research Beyond Blue's done, what we found is people think often that anxiety symptoms are just part of their personality. You know, just part of who what, what I'm like. I've always got stomach cramps and felt nausea you know, when I've had to do particular things. You know, Monday mornings, I've always felt horrible. Um, you don't have to feel like that. This is absolutely treatable. Uh, but with no treatment, it can become a very, very real uh, issue. So I've now given you a bit of a rundown of what anxiety looks like, what depression looks like. The fact that these conditions are very, very common. So in this room today, there will be a lot of people, or a number of people who are experiencing those symptoms today. Uh, and amongst your friends, colleagues and family, there will be a range of people who are in that space. It is normal because that's what, the, you know, that's, that's what we as human beings actually look like. What isn't normal is about is is not getting the treatment that we need. So I'd like to leave you with a challenge, um, and that challenge is, you know, you are going to be, you know, some of the cream of leaders in this country, you know, over the next generation. Uh, it's absolutely essential you look after yourselves. Problem with lots of us. Um, alpha male, alpha female, people, um, talented people like you, is that we often forget about our own health, particularly our own um, mental health. Uh, it's absolutely fundamental, if you're going to be the leader that you have the potential to be, that you have your own both physical and mental health um, in the right space. What do you need to do that? You need to know the symptoms of depression and anxiety. You need to get help if you need it. You need to have a solid underpinning um, set of values that you are comfortable with because it sort of just anchors um, your, your life and you do need to get the work-life balance right. If you don't, if it just becomes all about work, and you forget about family or the other things that are so important in getting that balance right, at the end of the day, it will impact upon your capacity to get that extra bit um, out of those, uh, those people in, that, you would, uh, that you will lead at some stage in your lives. So great leaders are people who also have a very definite focus on staying healthy, particularly staying mentally healthy. I thought I'd leave you with just um, a quick story. It's a real story. Um, a few years ago, in fact, uh, yeah, quite a few years ago now, um, two of my best friends were um, academics at ANU. Uh, we had children that were similar age. Uh, they both, they were both, one was a professor of physics and one was a professor of mathematics. Great at dinner parties, no, sorry, great at dinner parties. Actually, they were really great at dinner parties, even if they, you know, were a professor of pure maths. But anyway, by the by, um, they both got, uh, they, they both uh, ended up with postings to uh, the University of San Diego in the US. So they, off they went with the family to San Diego. Uh, and their um, daughter, Sal, went with them. Sal was just going to university at that stage, and it's an interesting scenario in the US, but it seems that you always go to college a very long way away from your parents. 
don't know about that, but that just seems to be a US sort of thing to do. Anyway, they, um, Sal went to university in Salt, in Salt Lake City, and I got a phone call from my friend early one morning, very early, she was in the US, um, absolutely beside herself in tears, and she said, um, she told me that she'd just got an email from Sal, and the email read, and I just happened to have it with me, it said, um, Dear Mum and Dad, um, please don't worry, but the dormitory's burnt down, but uh, it's okay, because I've moved in um, with the groundkeeper, a guy called Hal, he's got quite a lot of tattoos, he doesn't bathe too often, but we're getting on really well. Love, Sal, P.S., I think I'm pregnant. Now, my friend was pretty worried about this, um, and she, as you can see, was a bit beside herself about this, uh, this problem. We had a long talk and, you know, possibly, uh, um, she said, look, Sal's not answering a mobile, I've sent her SMSs, nothing's happening. I'm going to have to hop on the plane tomorrow uh, you know, morning. Um, as soon as I can get a plane to Salt Lake City, I'm going to have to hop on the plane and go and see her. There's nothing else for it. I said, oh, okay, that's, um, that sounds like a reasonable approach. My friend um, rang me back about two hours later, absolutely so happy. Haven't ever heard her so happy. She said, it's Kate, it's okay. I've just got an email from Sal, and she says, dear mum, it's okay, the dormitory didn't burn down. I haven't moved in with Hal, and I'm not pregnant but I did fail mathematics and I wanted you to put it in the right perspective. <laughs> so I'll leave you with the view that, you know, perspective's a pretty important thing, isn't it? Uh, and getting that balance right, making sure that you keep your life in perspective, keep focused on what's important to you, your values, your future, not somebody else's, is fundamental to good leadership. Thank you very much. Um, so, Kate Cornell is happy to, uh, to take questions. Um, I believe we have a roving microphone. Can I ask you to... Oh, excellent. Can I ask you to speak into that, please? No, I've got a thing. <laughs> See, I'm organised. Uh, hi, Kate. Nam Ewan, a third-year business student. Uh, I really found that last story uh, very entertaining, especially about perspective. My question is with regards to someone who is suffering from uh, mental health or post-traumatic stress. What advice would you give to them if they're um, battling that inner demon and weighing up its impact on their career and, and their advancement? Um, first, let me um, give you a bit of information about how to pick that in somebody um, who may be uh, in your area or... Um, one of the best ways to pick someone, someone who might be struggling a bit is if they've changed a lot. You know, if they used to really, you know, be the sort of person who was at the footy on Saturday or was always involved in um, uh, ad for events or, um, you know, they were an involved person, all of a sudden they're not. If they start withdrawing from uh, family, from friends, um, if, they, if they're just not the, the normal self, um, it's a really good indication that there just might be something that's, uh, that's, that's not quite right. The, importance, the important advice to give to answer um, your question, if you see that in somebody, first of all, it's important to ask, to, be, to, to know how to ask the question. How do you, how do you bring that up with somebody uh, who, you know, uh, who might be... Uh, part of a leadership group, you might be in charge of them, they might be the, well, whatever. How do you bring that up? Well, the best way to do it is to say, quite, quite simply, um, look, you don't seem to be your normal self. Um, how can I help? We naturally don't do that, you know? We naturally say, oh, it's too hard, we don't want to intrude, we don't want to get into people's personal space, you know, we should keep, you know, work and personal things separate. You can't in this case, 
this impacts upon um, you know, mental health th um, issues. Costs cost Australia about $12.6 billion a year. Last year, stress claims topped $10 billion. A person with depression will, on average, have three to four days off work every month, so it's almost a day off a week. So again, I'll get to, just to answer, answer your question. If you, get, um, if you get treatment early, you recover. It's that simple. This is not a life sentence by any stretch. There is no reason that having a mental health issue, whether it be um, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression or whatever, should have any more impact on your career than any other um, uh, medical condition that can be treated. The good thing about mental health issues is they can be cured. Um, for people who may have type 2 diabetes or a range of other things, that might not be the case. They might be dealing with it um, for their whole lives. This is curable. So the message is get support, get help. Uh, we, you know, in workplaces or ADFA or whatever, need to treat mental health exactly the same way as we treat physical health. So as leaders, we've got to make that clear. For us, mental health issues are identical to physical health issues and we will treat them the same way all the time. So the message is get, get help early because if you do, you'll recover and it won't affect your, um, your ongoing career in most cases. Look, there's going to be scenarios where that's not the case, where uh, the stress or the mental health issues is related to the actual job or the career. It's just something that's not right for you. Um, if that's the case, as I said, don't do something you're not passionate about. Life's too short. You know, go and find something you are. Um, <laughs> I'll just get uh, Liam Jones, second year artist. Um, as an ex-politician, um, you've talked extensively about values. Um, how do you reconcile um, sticking to your values but then getting the job done as a politician? Have there been any instances where you've had to compromise on your values uh, to achieve certain goals? Um, look, it's, a, it's a, a really good question because I think most people perceive that politicians compromise values all the time. Um, I don't think that's the case. In fact, from my perspective, the only way you can deal with what is a pretty difficult environment, you know, where you know most days in the newspaper you you can read about how what a crummy person you are, really, um, or what you've done that's wrong, or, or whatever. You know, it's quite a difficult environment to to operate in and not take those sorts of, you know, the sort of ongoing criticism that is simply part of the political environment um, really seriously. The only way you can do that is to have an underpinning solid value system that's yours, not somebody else's, that's yours, and be confident that you've been true to it. Um, that doesn't mean you're right, it just means that you have stuck to what you believe is right. Your question is, have I ever been in a position where I've compromised that? Fact is yes, and it's the thing I regret most about my time as Chief Minister. Um, some of you, the older ones here, will remember that the two um, governments or, um, that, I, uh, that, that I led were minority governments, so we had ranges of independence uh, that I needed to get budgets or any legislation over the line, they, they varied in, uh, in, in their colour over the, uh, the nearly six years I was Chief Minister from Green to quite far right, really, um, in, in some cases. Um, it was a particular scenario where I needed, well, you know, you do need a budget to go through because public servants have this thing that they really like to be paid. And if you don't pay them, they get quite upset about it. So, um, so we needed the budget to, to, to pass. To do that, I needed the support of two independents that came from the right. For those of you who remember, Dave Rugendike and Paul Osmond, 
The Greens were never going to support us and the Labor Party were going to oppose the budget. So I needed the two of them. Their trade-off was uh, they wanted me to do, to make it much more difficult for women in the ACT to get an abortion. I am very pro-choice personally. Um, that's what I believe. Um, I compromised with them, but in the end, the outcome was that, uh, that there would be a 48-hour cooling off period, which I didn't have a problem with, but that every woman who sought a termination in the ACT would be required to read a particular book about, you know, terminations, what they meant, what the pictures, and they had pictures in them of, um, of fetuses. They were, they were pictures out of, you know, a biology book. They weren't dramatic. I agreed to do that. I should have let them take my budget down. Um, in the end, I am ashamed that I did that. Um, the good, le the, the, because I don't believe it was the right thing to do, it was a compromise. But from my perspective, it was not the right thing to do. So I shouldn't have done it, regardless of whether it was, a, it was the right thing to do or it wasn't. I think it was wrong. Um, so I still um, see that as, um, as a mistake. If you compromise your values, it usually is. It's not about right or wrong. It's about if, the, if you compromise your values, what's the base? You know, what's the base of decision making? What's the base of your sense of self? There isn't one really. Hi. Last question, uh, then. Yep. Just in regards to uh, the people that may have depression, you're saying that there's a very likely chance of people within the room having depression. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of the medical system, but uh, as we handle weapons and we do currency on them, saying that you have depression or have, say, a suicidal ideations or anything like that may affect your career very likely. Um, the people within this room are more likely to keep it quiet. Um, I was just wondering what you have to say to those people that might have those thoughts and think it is a career, possibly a career ender. Uh, what do you have to say to them in regarding processes or things they can do to help? Well, it's interesting you say that because I had a meeting with Robin Walker not too long ago about this exact issue. She assured me that that wasn't the case. That. You know, people who, uh, who seek treatment for depression and anxiety um, will not have their career affected. I accept that I was seeing her for, the, for that purpose because we get feedback that the reason that people in the Defence Force don't put up their hand is they're worried about their career. She assures me that that's not the case. So I take her, her, her word for that. Thanks. Right, uh, maybe you could, uh, could explore that through your chain of command. Um, what, I'd, what I'd like to do now before we, before we wrap up is to uh, call on uh, Senator Johnson to deliver a vote of thanks. CDF and Mrs Hurley. Professor Freighter and Mrs Freighter, Commandant Commodore Kafer and Mrs Kafer, uh, Steve Robertson representing Chief of the Air Force, distinguished guests, um, members of ADFA, we have been very privileged tonight to hear from someone who is the epitome of what we would all want as a role model. As young people, we seek to visualise the sort of person who uh, encapsulates the values of doing your very best at all times, of being honest, of disclosing respect and providing a fair go for all. As a Liberal, Kate, I can say I've been in awe of you for a long, long time being the Chief Minister in the ACT from 95 to 2000. Enough of the politics. Um, many of you don't know that there have been very significant highs and very significant lows in Kate's very successful life and she's been uh, very honest with us all tonight and I think 
the honesty has been something we can all take away from here and look at and see and seek to emulate. In politics and in public life, honesty is a very difficult thing to find, but you've seen it here tonight. Um, can I say that she's obviously founded her success on a great deal of respect to her fellow travellers, to the people here in the ACT. Um, that also is something we can take away with us. And in her role as being the CEO of Beyond Blue, and many parliamentarians deal with uh, mental illness, anxiety issues, depression, intellectual disability as a primary constituency issue. Having Kate in such an important position, being able to produce these really crucial issues in our community, bring them to the surface and advocate for them so magnificently is something that I think um, says a lot about the quality of our country. The last thing I want to say about Kate is that she brings a further E to the equation, experience. As young people, and as I look out upon all of you here tonight, it is very hard to see, to observe, to learn from experience. Some of you will learn very difficult lessons from experience. But as I say, the mind's eye picture, the role model of experience talking to you tonight has been a very, very significant positive and valuable thing. Kate, I wish you very well on behalf of all of us here tonight. Beyond Blue is a really important institution. I wish you well in the future and more power and strength to you. Thank you for talking to us tonight. not on your program tonight, uh, but I'm distressed. Two questions tonight about uh, mental health damaging my career. If we walk out, of, if any of you walk out of this institution in two or three years' time to lead soldiers, sailors and airmen in the ADF, and you walk out with the view that having a mental illness is bad for your career, then we are lost as an organisation. We are lost. There's no part of any performance report that the ADF puts out that says, is this person being treated for a mental illness? Your job will be to identify people who are and bring them to help, not to sit on the sideline. Have a think about it. Thank you uh, very much. Um, that's the uh, end of uh, the formalities for this evening. Um, could I just ask people to remain seated while the official party leaves?